The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. So I was asked to talk about surface settlement from the co-moderator, who is a former graduate student, but he's not here, so I get the pleasure to, to do this. And um, try to put a presentation on the surface settlement, how it's affecting the behavior of SCC. But uh, the lessons learned here could be applied for uh, all type of concretes. SCC, as you know, is a concrete that uh, has to have very specific uh, rheological properties to ensure that what you see over here does not happen after you strip the formwork. So this is typical surface settlement issues that you can get when the concrete is not stable. And I think the for former presenter, previous presenter, told us about settlement and factors contributing to this. So in my presentation, I will uh, briefly go over some of the uh, functional requirements of uh, what makes self-consolidating concrete uh, what it is, in terms of workability point of view, rheological point of view, and then how do you assess surface settlement? We saw today one example of how to do that. And then uh, briefly touch on some of the factors, selected factors affecting f uh, surface settlement of SEC. But then I'd like to concentrate my presentation on what is the, what are the negative effects of settlement. And here I'm picking up on two important parameters, bond to rebars, especially rebars that are on the top of a deep uh, structural element and the transport properties. So as you know, uh, SCC uh, has to have a, a very high uh, uh, slump flow, i.e. low yield stress, which is a minimum resistance to shear to induce uh, flowability. So we have to design a concrete with very low yield low yield stress, where, where the bleeding becomes uh, issue, segregation becomes issue and settlement. So it has to be uh, also uh, highly uh, stable, and this is highly stable once it's being cast, and that's dynamic segregation resistance, but also after casting until the onset of hardening. And here you, you have a, an example of a concrete where the air bubbles are coming to the top and some um, water paste. And uh, this combination of uh, low yield stress and moderate viscosity have to be optimized in order for the concrete to flow under its own weight and uh, uh, ensure complete filling of the formwork without any vibration and without any blockage. So these are the functional requirements. These are the challenges we have to deal with when we are doing proportioning and material selection of SCC. Now that makes it easier if we have a rheometer uh, because with the rheometer we can like this one here, contact five, we can determine the yield stress and the plastic viscosity and draw a zone, in this case, uh, a zone where, where, whereby uh, any point inside it, the concrete will have the requirements that I described. And the important requirement over here are the ability to fill the formwork without any consolidation, we call that passing ability, and also the stability of the concrete. And here you see that uh, like as the yield stress decreases, so does the uh, slump flow of the concrete. The concrete becomes more and more fluid going into 700 millimeter. So if the concrete is very fluid, i.e. yield stress is very low, you have to build in viscosity to ensure that you have good suspension and reduction you know, of, of, of all the solid particles and reduction of settlement. So, we don't use rheometers on site. We usually use uh, uh, robust test method, field-oriented, measure all the properties that I alluded to. So if you have adequate uh, workability, everything works well, and you have the performance that you need, and more and more we see uh, SCC being used in very challenging requirements, uh, requirements in this case for the repair of uh, transportation infrastructure. This is a project outside Quebec City. Uh, that is for uh, Quebec DOT where they are doing repair of the bridge abutments and the main girders and some of the piles using SCC. And of course the main uh, concern over here is durability because those 
reinforced concrete elements had corroded, so you're removing the steel, putting new steel, and you have very congested area, and you're doing this in an area that is restricted, so the concrete is being pumped. And you want to make sure that the concrete is filling the format, but also developing very high durability. So again, today we're talking about surface settlements, but you can think about it as an index of stability and what's the impact of that stability on the performance. Now, if you don't uh, know what you're doing, uh, this is what you get. And this is an actual job site uh, from an SCC project where it was decided by someone that instead of putting super plasticizer and reducing the flow resistance, they just added water and they make the concrete more flowable. But when you add water, also you are reducing viscosity. So the concrete has low resistance to flow, but also very low cohesiveness. And you get issues with blockage and lack of pulling ability and passing ability. And then if you're not paying attention also to the concrete, you can get uh, some bleeding. And the previous presenter, I think, alluded exactly what's happening to the pore pressure, especially in deep structure elements. You can get a buildup of pore pressure, and you have basically water rushing up and giving you some of those bleed channels. So it's not everything that is at the top. There's bleed channels. There's entrapment under rebars and aggregates. And this is a, actually this, believe it or not, was a demonstration about how to do SCC, how to make SCC. And uh, unfortunately, when you have many people looking over your shoulder and everybody with a camera, Murphy is there and Murphy's Law <laughs> happened that uh, the concrete segregated terribly, uh, bled, and even have air bubbles coming to the top. So all of that contributes to settlements. On top of it, there were st some steel reinforcements here, st steel fibers, and every th everything sank to the bottom. So when you strip the formwork the next day, you do not want to see this. This is a surface settlement. And uh, you might see over here, there's a lot of air bubbles rushing to the surface. So some of the surface settlement is because of the air coming to the top. Some of it is simply consolidation of the concrete. And some of it can be because of segregation of bleeding. So how do we measure, how to evaluate surface settlement? Uh, here you have two, uh, one approach. Uh, this is uh, the approach that we used many years ago, and the slide is very old. But basically to have a, a column, a fresh concrete column, and then you put a small uh, a mirror, very thin mirror, and you shoot a laser beam, and deflection of that laser beam, you can evaluate what the deflection or what the settlement of the surface. And later on, the group of uh, Jason Wise at Purdue University developed a very similar test uh, where they also uh, have a laser and detect the surface settlement. And uh, so that's one approach to evaluate surface settlement. If you look over here at the surface settlement uh, versus slump of the concrete. So this is, again, an old study for flowable concrete with slumps of 150 all the way to 220. So five and six inches going to eight inches was a concrete of a fixed water cement ratio of 0.5. Uh, uh, so if you simply just add super plasticizer and you look at the surface settlement in solid, the surface settlement is going to increase. And then if you start putting some viscosity modifying admixtures, in this case, whale and gum, you can reduce it. If you put more, you can reduce it further. Now, if you look at the other y-axis, which is the bleeding, this is a bleeding that is collected at the surface. We don't always have the pleasure of having bleeding at the surface. And that's, uh, that's what you want to see, at least. No, no bleeding. But if you have a bleeding, again, you have the dotted line, 0% uh, VMA. And if you add some VMA, and if you add even more, you can eliminate bleeding. But elimination of bleeding up to 180 doesn't mean that there's no settlement. So it's, they still have a consolidation and segregation. And then if you will uh, take a look at many different sample sizes, this was 700 millimeter, you, you go lower and higher and collect uh, bleeding, collect settlement, collect segregation, and you normalize them to the volume of the, of the concrete, to the height of the sample. More or less, they are correlating. So when we talk about static stability, the bleeding, the surface settlement, segregation are kind of intercorrelated. And here you have some predicted settlement on the vertical axis of concretes made with different slumps and different viscosity enhancing agents versus measure, measurements. And there's a tendency that you understand more or less what's happening. If you measure one, you can predict the other one. 
So the message over here is static stability is more than surface settlement, it's more than bleeding, segregation, they're kind of interrelated physically. So after that study, we decided to pursue more uh, surface settlement and see what's the implication on performance, uh, develop a test method uh, that we've been using since, and it was uh, proposed to the AASHTO. And that's a, this is a, taking a sample of about two feet in height and casting that into a rigid PVC column. And at the top of the column, put a very thin uh, element that is anchored into the fresh concrete and then using either a dial gauge or an LVDT, ev evaluate or monitor the settlement of the concrete until uh, cancellation of settlement. So again, it's a, and it's, a, it's a test that you can use. So here you're looking into it. This is a, that uh, plexiglass. You would like to put, when you do this plexiglass, you would like to put a couple of holes just to allow the bleed water to seep through. Otherwise, uh, the whole plate will, will also float. Okay, so the response that you get out of it in pink, you have the surface settlements. And this is a sample of concrete. I believe this is SCC, showing you how the settlement increases. And then after about three hours, it stabilizes. Uh, so when it stabilizes, either it's because you don't have settlement anymore and the concrete is still plastic, or the concrete has reached its, its initial setting time. Okay? But one way we found out that it's, you don't have to wait until a few hours, if you look at the rate of settlements, and this is through many, many studies, we found out that if you look at the rate of settlements, around 30 minutes, the rate of settlement between 25 and 30 minutes is a good indication of what would be the ultimate settlement of the concrete. So you can do the test for 30 minutes. So what are some of the factors? Uh, well, one of the factors affecting stability is the water cement ratio. And this is because it's affecting rheology. And here you have rheograms between the torque and the rotation velocity of the rheometer. And you have two concretes, two SCCs with the same slump flow. None of them has any viscosity enhancing agents, but the water cement ratio is different. So the pink one has a lower water cement ratio. It's more viscous. It has more superplasticizer to adjust for both of them to have the same initial shear stress, which is a yield stress slump flow, but this one is more viscous and the viscosity is giving you higher stability. So if you were to look at the surface settlement of concretes like this, so these are all SCCs with exactly the same slump flow, same yield stress, 0.42 water cement ratio, 0.39, 0.35 in pink, and then as a reference one is 0.4 with internal consolidation. This is a so the SCCs, the three SCCs, 0 0.42, 39, 0 0.35, you could see that the settlement is decreasing. And a number here to keep in mind, I'll, I'll mention that later on, is 0.5% settlement. So the settlement here is expressed as a percentage of the column height, of the concrete height. So if you're filling the concrete 600 mm, this will be three, three millimeter of surface settlement. Okay, we're very happy when we have only four points and we have high correlation coefficient, but this is, those are the four, four points that correspond to that experiment. But you can see that there's a clear trend as the surface settlement uh, de decreases is because you are building viscosity. So as you are reducing the water cement ratio from uh, 0 0.42 to 30, 39 to 0.3, etc., you, for the same yield stress, slump flow, you are reducing you are increasing the plastic viscosity, and that's what is responsible for reducing the surface settlement. You can also reduce surface settlement, i.e. increase plastic viscosity of an SCC by using viscosity modify admixtures. So as you add VMA, uh, the slope increases, and you have to also add more superplasticizer to maintain the yield stress, of course. These are all have the same water to cement ratio. And if you look at the surface settlements, SCC without VMA, you get about 0.6%, small dosage, 0.5%, much higher dosage, 0.2%. So again, there are two approaches of uh, proportioning SCC to ensure static stability. Either lower the water cement ratio, and here we see that reduction of water cement ratio, 42 to 35, would reduce surface settlement or use 42, but also build, build up viscosity by using viscosity enhancing agents, and that is what's happening. Regardless, you can get SCC mixtures that are very stable. 
So some of the factors, uh, and the previous presenter expanded on that, but some of the factors contributing to the surface settlements, here we have the use of uh, uh, fillers. So when we do a SCC, we have to use a lot of binder, a lot of powder, I should say. And in uh, some cases, we use supplementary cementitious materials. And in some cases, we use that or uh, fillers. And the type of filler uh, is very important to densify, increase uh, rheology. But this is uh, the, the limestone filler, calcium carbonate. And then here we have the uh, particle size distribution of a type 1 cement versus limestone filler with a D50 of 8 micron and a one with a D50 of 3 micron. So the D50 of the Portland cement will be on the order of 17 a micron. So those are finer fillers. So what does that do to our surface settlement? So this is a surface settlement of uh, SCC with a fixed water to powder ratio, 42. Without any limestone filler, you have surface settlement of about 65%, with 20% replacement of cement by volume, 30%, reducing a little bit. But if you were to do the same thing with a much smaller, finer filler, then you can see a great improvement of stability and a clear reduction of surface settlement. And I think Caroline Talbot likes what she sees. All right, so there's many other factors, but let me move into, I think, the most important part of the presentation. So what? What's the effect of settlement or bleeding? Well, this is one of the effects. As you have bleeding and surface settlements, whether it's this is a rebar that is rigid, fixed to the, in the, in, in the, in the formwork, or this is a flo floating aggregate, you can get an ITZ that is weaker. And that is definitely going to affect your uh, bond, but also going to affect your transport properties. So bond is very important, especially if you're dealing with uh, pre-stressed concrete elements. These are um, ashto girders, and they have a certain height, and you have pre-stressing tendons, you have rebars, and you want to ensure that the bond is, is, is very, very high between the SCC and the embedded reinforcement. And if you are using SCC for uh, vertical construction, uh, high-rise buildings, uh, shear walls, columns, Again, bond between the concrete and the reinforcing steel determines the performance of the concrete. In this case, for repair, bond also is very important, especially when you are trying to develop concrete that has good resistance to cracking and good durability. So to simulate the effect of settlement on, uh, on bond strengths, we do some experiments in the lab. This is just one of them, uh, where we take a wall element measuring 1.5 meter in height, eight inches, about 0.95, and we put three bars at different heights. So these are the distances from the bottom. And we, we cast different concretes. They all have the same slump flow, uh, and they have either no viscosity modifying admixtures, or a low dosage, or a higher dosage. So this is Weyland gum, and you have here the concentrations. So as we saw previously, for the same slump flow, as you increase the viscosity, modify admixture dosage, you're going to build viscosity, and the viscosity is going to help you reduce your surface settlement. If you were to cast those columns or wall elements and then saw cut them, polish them, and look at the coarse aggregate distribution using image analysis, this is what you would find. So all of these values here are the coarse aggregate content divided by the coarse aggregate content at the bottom. So everything is normalized to what happens at the bottom. And just as a reference, you have the blue one, which is a vibrated concrete. So this is eight inch slump, 1.5 meter uh, wall element that is vibrated into lifts. And this is the distribution that you get. So at the top, you have about 30% less coarse aggregate than at the bottom. Obviously, you have segregation. And then this is a viscosity modifier admixture, low dosage, you have similar behavior, and the high dosage, you have almost no segregation. So the lower the segregation coefficient, the more stable the, the concrete is. Now what does that mean in terms of in-situ properties? So one good way of looking at whether you have a stable concrete or not, go to that wall element at a certain height, take a horizontal core, and take a vertical core and test them in compression or tension or elastic modulus and see if those values are more or less similar. So that's what's happening here. The 200 millimeter vibrated concrete, if you take a vertical core, compressive strength 
divided by the compressive strength of the horizontal core, you see that, and these are many cores over the heights, you see that there's a very large variability. Typically, the vertical one would be higher. And the reason for that, this is what is shown here. This is a vertical one, and these are the embedded aggregates, and underneath them in black is that accumulation of bleed water and settlements. When you apply a stress that is perpendicular to this weakness zone, it's compressing it. But if you were to apply it parallel to this weakness zone, line of forces are aligned and you have a lower apparent compressive strength. And we see over here with the highly stable concrete, this is much, much reduced. So you're almost taking an isotropic material to isotropic, an isotropic to isotropic material. Okay, we said we're going to talk about bonds. So you cast those concrete elements. In, in, in this experiments, we even have some pre-stressing strands. And then you limit the uh, embedment lengths to about two and a half bar diameter. You flip them and then you do the pull-out test and you measure the slip at the bottom. So what you have here on the vertical axis is the distance from the bottom. So these are, there are four rebars or four strands at four different depths. And on the horizontal axis, you have the top bar effect. Top bar effect, you can think about it as the ratio of the embedment lengths at the top, L1, divided by the embedment lengths at the bottom, L2, to develop the same pull-out load, not stress, load. So in order to, to have the same kips of pull-out load, how much more embedments? And that is the pull-out. This is the top bar effect. So most of course, say, if you have a member where you have less, more than 12 inches of concrete underneath it, you have to embed your rebars about 1.3 or 1.4, depending on the code. So here we see that the concrete with very low surface settlement has top bar effect less than 1.1. It's, it's completely uniform. The concrete that shows more surface settlement, the top bar effect is going to be affected. And these are many studies, including flowable concretes and all the way from six, seven inches into SCC. There's a clear relationship between the top bar effect and the maximum settlements. As the settlement increases, you have to provide more embedment of your rebars, more overlap of your rebars to develop the same pull-out load. And this is the same work, also 1.5, but here we're dealing with also pre-stressing strands. And this is work was done a few years ago for an NCHRP project where we specifically took SCCs that have very, very good functional requirements characteristics. So performance characteristics, slump flow is high, passing ability, jeering, L-box, filling capacity is extremely high, VSI, visual stability index, really good. But if you best test the surface settlement, which in my opinion is the best test out there for static stability, you can differentiate a lot between the behavior of these concretes. So this is one concrete that has low yield stress, low viscosity, low tixotropy, surface settlement about 0.7, and this is a medium, and this is high, and this is the reference vibrated concrete. And if you look at the distribution of aggregate, not distribution, the compressive strengths of a core at a certain height versus a bottom, you see that this concrete here that has low surface settlement is very good, almost the same compressive strengths in situ. The one that was very surprising is this one. Although the surface settlement was very low, it develops in situ properties that are inferior to the bottom. Okay? And then if the, surf if the surface settlement is not adequate, then you obviously have heterogeneous distribution of mechanical properties. When you do bonds, it's even worse. So this is the top bar effect. You want something 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. And you can see the vibrated concrete behaves this way. The medium VMA content that is perfectly straight. And the one that is low, high, high set surface settlement is what you expect. But the one, again, that was very surprising is this one. Any guess what happened there? Very, very stable mix, very viscous. What happened is that we entrapped air bubbles. So if the viscosity is so high, you can entrap air bubbles, and you don't encapsulate your rebars, and that can affect settlement. Okay, very quickly, the last part is what, what about transport property? What about it? 
So in this uh, study, we wanted to look at the effect of surface settlement of SCC stability on corrosion behavior of concrete. So we cast some wall elements, 1.5 meters, and we have set of rebars. As you can see over here, they kind of staggered, and then we so cut those into four different sections. We connected them together, and we did some accelerated corrosion testing. So we're looking at the, the onset of corrosion um, between the cathode and the anode, which is uh, rebars, for rebars having different, embed, uh, different covers. Okay. I'll just show you one example of the, the type of response you get. So this is uh, one of the rebars. And the time here, the, the, the intensity of the current. So initially you have a certain current. And then after about 30 days, you have an increase in current. And this is the onset of corrosion. And then current is increasing because you're starting to have corrosion, expansion, cracking, and then serious cracking, and it takes off. So I'm going to compare is the effect of surface settlement on this onset of corrosion. So surface settlement, here we're showing it for one set of rebars, 35 millimeter cover. And then uh, you have the control without VMA. The SCC, well, this is vibrated concrete. The SCC without VMA, the 0.03% viscosity enhancing agent, and the 0.075. So more settlement, uh, high settlement, medium settlement, low settlement. And what you could see if, if you compare, this is a distance from the bottom. So if you compare, for example, the one at the top, near the top, 140, uh, that's not, uh, this should be centimeter, I'm sorry. No, actually, it's 1.42 meter, yes. So 1.42 meter near the top, you see that uh, the onset of corrosion here is about 45 days, a little bit more, and with a more surface settle, uh, less surface settlement, even, even higher. The same thing happens near the bottom. So it goes higher and higher. And in the middle, it's even the highest. So building surface settlement resistance, building viscosity is increasing this. Okay. And if you want to convince yourself a little bit more, you, you can cast different columns and take some cores in, into them and look at diffusion coefficient. Actually, go and do some diffusion coefficient testing of the cores. And this was done for SCC. And here I'm, jo I'm showing you again something I, I, I presented earlier. And that is the effect of the water cement ratio on surface settlement. All of them have the same slump flow, about 27 inches. Surface settlement is decreasing by reducing water cement ratio. And if you look at the distribution of the in-situ properties, so this is a 56-day diffusion coefficient. By the way, all of these concretes have a ternary binder, silica fume and fly ash. And look at the distribution. So this one is a vibrated, conventional vibrated concrete at 0.4 in-situ distribution. And this is a coefficient of variation. If you look at the SCC with 0.39, Again, this is the distribution, coefficient of variation is 10%. If you look at the 0.35, which is the most stable one, least surface settlement, distribution is coefficient of variation 2%. So even your in-situ properties, and diffusion coefficient is a very, very, very uh, uh, sensitive to the microstructure, is being improved by reducing the surface settlement. Now what happens here if we use a 0.42? 0.42, again, you have values, and on the top you have much higher value because of the surface settlement and the effect of bleeding. Coefficient of a variation of 26%, and you can bring that back if you were to add a viscosity modifying admixture, where the surface settlement goes back down, you build viscosity, and you get more or less homogeneous behavior. So in conclusion, and this conclusion is really about SCC because that's what I am presenting, uh, static stability is very important for SCC. If you are uh, looking at static stability, you can look at this visual stability index, which is more or less subjective. If you want to do more testing in terms of development of the tests uh, of the mixture or quality control, you can do the column segregation. This is ASTM test, and there's two different interpretations of the test. But really the one that, in my opinion, gives you the best performance, uh, reflection of the performance of static stability is some indication of surface settlement, regardless of the sample size and how you do it. 
And here we are giving some recommendation. This is NCHRP results. If you're using 3 8 aggregate, half inch aggregate, your surface settlement should be less or equal to 0.5% of the sample height. And if you're doing its rate of settlement after 30 minutes, that number should be 0.25% per hour of settlement. If your aggregate size increases, then you have to build more viscosity to suspend your aggregate, and your surface settlement should be less than 0.3, rate of settlement 0.12% per hour. Now for these SCC mixtures, in order to prevent this very, very viscous concrete that prevents good bond, you should limit your plastic viscosity to 80 pascal second. And we can translate that also to a V-funnel test and a T50 test. And if you do that, your in-situ compressive strength should be larger than 90% of your cylinders, and your top bar effect should be less than 1.4. Thank you. Okay. You, want to have you picked up on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a good observation. So what uh, Mr. Yazbek is saying that uh, when you didn't have any VMA, uh, the 0.42, this is the in-situ uh, diffusion coefficient, and when you added the VMA, you have a larger one. Um, just one, uh, one thing, all of these concrete had very low coulombs. So when you add a VMA, VMA is an ionic product, it's a polysaccharide. It's going to have more ionic charge. The more ionic charge, you're going to have more diffusion. But uh, still, those values, anything below 2.5, 10 to the minus 12, is very, very durable. Right, right, right. So you're picking up on the, and, and Jason, this is based on a lot of data points. There's more, probably more than 100 data points on flowable concrete SCC consistencies. You're looking at uh, what happens at the slope between 25 and 30 minutes, and how that slope over here is lower, less, less, higher and higher, and what happens with the maximum settlements. There's a good correlation. I forgot the R square and stuff. I can check it out and send you the reference. But there's a good correlation. And that was part of the NCHRP study that we did with a lot of concretes. If you don't want to wait, because in some cases even you have extended retention, fluidity retention, and if your concrete is not stable, it might keep on bleeding, it might keep on segregating. <laughs> That's a problem. But uh, if your concrete is stable, there's a prediction that you can do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.